Hi, I'm Dr. Michael DeTola, and I'd like to welcome you to this video clinical presentation from Glidewell Laboratories. Today we're going to be looking at an interesting case. In this case, we have a patient who is unhappy with a couple aspects of her smile. She's not particularly happy with the shade of her teeth. As you can see, there's been a lot of yellowing that's going on. She does not like her midline diastema. And um, she also noticed, she didn't tell me that her midline was off, but she noticed that her teeth weren't lined up straight when she smiled. Um, one of the things that I also noticed was an anterior crossbite, as you can see on this preoperative photograph. When she bites together, tooth number 10 is in fact in crossbite. And I also noticed that we have some buccal corridor problems on the bicuspids as well. So this was a, a good opportunity for me to take a study model, send it to my technician, and have them tell me what they would like me to do. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later on when we look at the diagnostic wax up at all. But a decision was made to use thin press. It's our pressed porcelain here at Glidewell that we can use for no prep veneers. We can use them for minimal prep veneers. We can use them for traditional veneers, or we can use them for full crowns as well. And that's what we're going to do in this case is a mix of things. That tooth number 10 that's in crossbite, we're going to go ahead and prepare that for a full crown to move it back out where it needs to be in a more facial uh, position. And then we're going to do some uh, prep veneers on uh, the other teeth, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 11. And then where we have deficiencies on teeth number 4, 5, and 12, we're going to do some no prep veneers. This is the prep guide for this case. You can tell it's the prep guide because of the sticker that says prep guide on it. So you know the laboratory has done some reduction here to show us what was done underneath that diagnostic wax up. So basically they prepare the model, they duplicate it, and then they do the wax up on that. So this is exactly what they prep to reach that diagnostic wax up. So you can see that even though the patient has a midline diastema before we start, they want me to prep this. It says to move midline written up here, although I knew why they wanted me to do that. And you can see where this light green marker is that they prepared on the mesial surface of tooth number eight and the mesial surface of tooth number nine. And uh, as you'll see in the patient's uh, photographs, we do need to shift that midline over just a little bit to the right. So we're going to prepare that. You can see this lateral incisor has had almost the entire facial surface with min really minimal reduction there. And this cuspid has also had facial reduction on it. These two bicuspids are going to be no prep veneer, so those were not touched at all. You can see when you look from the incisal that there was no incisal preparation done there. They carried it back but they did not go on to the lingual, so they did not prepare a full incisal edge like we would typically do, although in some cases you could certainly receive a model that had it prepped there. Then as we look over at tooth number 10, we're going to see they did in fact prepare a full crown, and as you'll see on the photograph, that was necessary uh, because of the fact that we wanted to correct the anterior crossbite that was there. And then as we look at the cuspid, tooth number 11, you can see they have prepared about two-thirds of the way over and they've left the distal third alone, and this is pretty common in some of these preparations that we do. The veneer is going to cover the entire tooth, but they really only need us to remove from the mesial half of the tooth, from this facial surface over here. And this is typically left alone. Unless the uh, cuspid happens to be really rotated with that distal half kicked out, you don't have to do much reduction here. This bicuspid won't need any preparation. That's a no prep veneer. And then these three teeth are PFM, so they already have porcelain on there. So when I look at this, especially for a minimal prep case like this, it really gives me an idea of where I have to prep. And anywhere the models aren't marked, I don't prepare at all. That's what our plan is uh, going into this case, and um, pretty straightforward. Not uh, a lot of difficulty here in a case like that. We know we're going to have to do certain things in order to be able to uh, shift the midline, for example, we will have to open that diastema up in between teeth number eight and nine. You can see we're doing that here with our 856 5 burr. So we begin by going in and opening that space between there. That was marked on the study model for me and makes it very easy. And anywhere that I can see they have reduced the teeth, I go in with that burr and begin to reduce on the tooth specifically in those areas. I was taught to do veneers by removing all of the enamel from the teeth down to the dentin, and I've really changed my philosophy over the last 15 years. I take away as little enamel as, uh, as possible. And on one hand, you give the technician a little less to work with, but it's been my opportunity that being able to bond to enamel and not having to worry about post-operative sensitivity, those concerns 
win out a lot of times. If I'm going to do a more aggressive preparation to give the technician the ultimate freedom in terms of designing that uh, restoration to make the smile look great, I'm probably going to go to a crown at this point rather than a bonded veneer. That's just been my experience over the years and what's been successful for me. So we continue to use that same burr. It's one of my favorite burrs as we go along and prep these veneers, removing anywhere where they have marked it on the model for me. We're not going to use that reverse prep technique that you've probably seen me do on some other cases here because um, it's just not that kind of preparation. Those are really uh, crown preparations and again with the help of that diagnostic study model we're letting the technicians tell us you know where tooth structure needs to be removed and only trying to remove that. To me there's nothing better than letting the technician tell you what to do and if they do a suck down vacuum form splint over that prep model as long as you assure yourself that you have removed enough tooth structure they should easily be able to accomplish what they've done on the diagnostic wax up. Here we are placing the double zero cord as part of the two cord technique around the crown on tooth number 10 that we have prepared. That crown will be bonded into place. It'll be an all ceramic crown, again, thin press. And now that that cord's down all the way and the two ends are flush, we go back in with that 856025. And you can see that leaves a shoulder margin or a deep chamfer, whatever you want to call it, with a rounded internal line angle. And uh, I just want to make sure I give the technicians a nice big margin for them to see so there's no question in their mind where it is. And more importantly, where the margin ends. And we're going to do the same thing on the adjacent teeth now, packing that double zero cord into place. That cord's from Ultradent. It's a hollow knitted cord, so it's very easy to pack down into place. Typically, I will floss the double zero cord uh, through the mesial and distal contacts and then grab the two ends in the lingual and kind of pull it tight um, and work my way around, packing it subgingival as we go around. Again, you're going to clip the end uh, of the retraction cord so that when you pack uh, the second end of the cord subgingivally, the two ends will be flush. We do not want any of this first cord exposed. We want it to be completely subgingival. If the two ends over, overlap a little bit, that's fine too. That usually won't be enough to uh, get in the way of the number two cord that's going to come next. Where we don't break contacts on the veneer such as here, we just clip the retraction cord as close as we can to the papilla and then tuck that in interproximally. Obviously, it's very difficult to floss this double zero cord through closed contacts on teeth. In fact, you'll pretty much automatically shred it this retraction cord is not nearly as tough as dental floss. And there's no reason to pack the inner proximal in a case like that anyway because we're not breaking the contact. So we don't even need the cord to go onto the lingual or through the contact. The number two cord goes on top, stays in place for 8 to 10 minutes, and then we pull that out. You can see it being pulled right there from tooth number 10. And when that top cord comes out after 8 to 10 minutes, We've got a very nice, well-defined sulcus for us to be able to squirt impression material. That's medium body impression material, the purple. I've injected on the teeth, and there's the yellow heavy body in the tray, the perforated metal tray that's being sat right there. I use medium body because with this two-core technique, you'll find that you get a lot of material subgingival, and you don't want it to tear. And that's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the light body material. I think a lot of dentists use light body material thinking that they're going to be able to drive it further subgingival. In my experience, the only way to drive impression material subgingival is to retract the tissue. You just can't, it's very difficult to do it, whether it's with an H&H &H technique or something like that. And some doctors have success with it, but I find a lot more success with this two-court technique. And yes, it takes a little more time, sometimes a lot more time, depending on the size of the case, but I find it's well worth it and very predictable. We're now putting the capture hard bite bite registration material between just the prep teeth and the opposing teeth and then putting a wooden stick in here uh, to give the technicians an idea of where we want the incisal edges. I've already paralleled the incisal edges of the prep so that they would be able to use that as well, but we take a stick bite too. Here's the diagnostic wax up for this case. As I always do with diagnostic wax ups, we use white wax on a white model. I, just have found over the years there's no better presentation model to show the patient than white wax on a white model. White wax on a yellow model doesn't seem to do it. Yellow wax on a yellow model doesn't do it. A lot of lab technicians like to use gray wax because you can see a lot of surface texture and anatomy, but that doesn't really do much for the patient either. So I would suggest you stick with white wax 
on a white model. Uh, we're going to take a putty wash impression of this to make our temporaries. First, take a carving instrument, probably something a little sharper than an explorer, and go around this gingival sulcus and really define this well with, say, a half Hollenbeck or a small discoid cleoid. This is going to pay big dividends in the mouth when you take this uh, putty wash matrix off the teeth and see how nice your temporaries look. Now we're going to go ahead and use the diagnostic wax up to fabricate a temporary putty matrix that we're going to use to make the provisionals. Here my dental assistant is mixing the putty base and catalyst and has mixed it until there's no streaks, doing it without gloves on so that we don't get any contamination. And she's going to take this impression putty and just push, roll it into a hot dog and then push it down onto this diagnostic wax up. You just want to make sure you cover uh, all the areas of the teeth on the facial and the lingual. And it doesn't matter if you go too far down. We want to cover some teeth that aren't being prepped as well. So we have a nice positive seat when we go to the mouth with this. It's not critical that you get great fit of this putty material into every little nook and cranny of the teeth because we're going to reline this in just a minute with some light body material. And my dental assistant is now taking the light body capture material and squirting it into that putty matrix. You know, most of the time when you look at that putty matrix, the amount and the level of the detail is truly amazing. But just to make sure we get all the little things, especially along the gingival march, and we fill it with light body, push the putty into place, and typically you'll see the light body ooze out from around that putty matrix. And this will really give you your detailed impression. One area you want to be careful with, uh, again, is to take that diagnostic wax up and really make sure the gingival margin is clean with a little carving instrument just to make sure that your temporaries are going to be nice and, and flush and it's going to require very little finishing intraorally. Once the putty wash matrix is set completely, you can see I'm squirting the temporary material into that matrix. This happens to be Luxatemp, and uh, they make a bleach shade in this temporary material. So if you have really thin veneers, that can look really good. And this happens to be a B1. You can see the notch that I've put there in the midline, just so I know exactly where it's supposed to go. We seat that in because the putty wash matrix covers several molars that we're not prepping. It'll seat and have a nice firm seat. And then we take this off after three minutes. And I don't know how many times I've seen this on film, but I never stop being amazed when I take that putty wash matrix out and see how good those temporaries look and how little finishing they need uh, to make them highly acceptable. It's just a fantastic technique. And for something that was so difficult, provisionals for veneer preps, it really is the best way around and some of the best looking temps that we have. Here are those chairside temps two weeks later. Patient is back for the try-in appointment. We don't call it the cementation appointment because we don't know if we're cementing anything today, but we are going to try some things in. Since we've mechanically locked these temporary veneers into place, we're using a 57 burr to cut a vertical groove, a vertical slot into these temporary veneers and um, you know you want to be careful not to cut too deep of course it's a little easier under magnification I find it's even easier uh, with the water off on the handpiece if there's some question in your mind but as long as you don't prep you know deeply uh, into the tooth and even if that happens you can euphemistically call it an anti-rotational groove I've certainly made that comment to my dental assistant before and then she'll comment shouldn't you have done that before the impression but Regardless, you know, be conservative as you go in there, and you can see we're able to wiggle the rest of those temporary veneers off. You can see we've got just a couple spots of bleeding here, and that's usually an area where we had slightly over-contoured uh, temporary. So we'll keep an eye on that, and we've got our viscostat clear from Ultranet by our side if we need it. Since these were mechanically locked on without any layer of cement, we probably had some leakage uh, while these temporary veneers were on. Again, that's not a huge deal with the minimal prep veneers, but we're cleaning this with some pumice just to make sure that we get all the gunk off the teeth. So now it's time to try on the veneers, and we're going to try these on with the Variolink Veneer Cement. My favorite shade is the Translucent, or the Zero Shade, because it doesn't make these veneers look uh, really opaque. and. Uh, if we're going to try to get color, we want to try to do it in the veneer and not necessarily so much with the shade of the cement. So I prefer translucent cements for good light transmission and to keep them from looking like opaque PFM. So we're trying these on. 
uh, one at a time. They're going in with the veneer cement. Um, you can try them in individually without the veneer cement if you want to uh, ahead of time, and that's typically uh, how I used to do it. Now, most of the time, we've really dialed these in with my technician, and I'm trying them in with try and cement because I find that they're going to place and seating really well in the first attempt. And again, my assistant's going around with the micro brush, cleaning up that excess try and cement. I don't know why that stuff tastes so bad, uh, but it does. So we try to keep it away from the patient's tongue. It doesn't seem like it would be too obnoxious. And so we have the veneers on uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 tried in. Actually, that's the crown on tooth number 10. And the no prep veneers are tried in on the bicuspids as well, and the patient looks in the mirror and approves. So we are ready to loot these all into place. We're going to begin by etching teeth number 8 and 9 with 37% phosphoric acid. I always start with teeth 8 and 9, and I do them alone. Anytime I have a bonded restoration, I just want to make sure that we get those two teeth perfect, because that'll ruin the whole smile if we screw that up. Sometimes on crown and bridge cases, because of the way crown and bridge fits, versus some of these bonded uh, all ceramic restorations, especially veneers. We'll do more than that, but we're always just doing eight and nine when it comes to these veneers. You may be able to tell that bonding agent is um, just uh, adhesive material. This is not a dentin bonding agent because there's no dentin there. We were able to keep our preparations in enamel, which I love uh, because we're gonna get the strongest bond in dentistry, and I know we're not gonna have any post-operative sensitivity. So that's just that dark green bottle from the Scotch Bond system, that adhesive, because we have no dentin exposed on those teeth. And that is my favorite way uh, to do veneers these days, those minimal prep veneers where we remove just enough tooth structure to make the technician happy, but we don't go down into dentin. So eight and nine are now, have now been placed, and we're doing what we call a tack and wave by just holding the curing light above it for a couple seconds and getting the material to its gel state. I don't like cleaning veneer cement off when it's still liquidy because I don't like to pull it out from under the margins but you can see here when it hits this doughy stage it uh, peels off very easily and it cleaves off right at the margin and that's a real nice way to be able to do that on the facial and the lingual sometimes you'll overcook it a little bit and have to go in there but if I'm checking around cleaning it up and there's an area where it's still not set my assistant will come in and cure again and there's the crown the ultimate awesome crown on tooth number 10 being pushed into place with an orange wood stick. The strength of thin press, I've been impressed. I put in no prep veneers, minimal prep veneers, uh, and crowns like this with those orange wood sticks, and I just don't break those thin press restorations. The strength on those is really, really nice. That's 3M SB's Relax Unisem that we have used to put that crown on with, and that'll go through a chemical cure on its own, but we are curing it with the curing light in order just to accelerate the cleanup process. And we're using a serrated strip here to go in between those teeth and clean that out. How would you ever do adhesive dentistry without those adhesive strips? I just, uh, if we were going to put a case on like this and we were out of those strips, I think we'd reschedule the patient, honestly. I can't do adhesive dentistry without them. Here we are etching teeth number 11 and 12 for the veneers. Tooth number 11 has been prepped. Tooth number 12 has been a no prep. You can see tooth number 13, 14, and 15 are PFMs, so we're going to leave those as is. I suppose if they were really horrifically ugly PFMs that we could have prepped the porcelain off tooth number 13 and made a veneer for that that would have bonded to the porcelain, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't necessary here. A lot of times you don't find out till you get to the last tooth that you have a contact problem with veneers because they keep all sliding over because they don't fit quite like crown and bridges do regardless of what we may think um, their fit is like. They don't fit like crowns and bridges. So... My favorite thing to do is seat the most distal uh, veneer in the case typically and then leaving one in between those and then I can adjust contacts there if I need to. So that's what you saw me do there. Over on the other side, we're, we've gone ahead and etched teeth number 6 and 7 with the 37% phosphoric acid. And this is Optibond being used because uh, we do have a little dent and surface that showed through on those two teeth. And we can cure that with our light. It doesn't take long to set that. And then, of course, we're placing those veneers in with the orange wood stick again because I'm a big fan of the orange wood stick. Why do I like the orange wood sticks? Well, I can generate some pressure that I couldn't with my finger. And when I seat things with my finger, the restoration always kind of digs into my finger because the flesh has some give to it. And I use these with one on the incisal edge and one on the facial to make sure restorations are down on the way. I just can't overemphasize that with veneers. You know, veneers just don't have the same fit characteristics as our crown and bridges do, and we really need to make sure they're in place when we cure them in. And so with that one orange wood stick on the incisal and that one 
pressing on the, towards the tooth on the facial, I can assure that that veneer doesn't go anywhere while my assistant does her tack and wave. Teeth number four and five are no prep veneers. If you recall, uh, when we looked at the before picture, we could see we had a buccal corridor discrepancy where these tooth were basically invisible. And that's a nice situation to have because the no prep veneers work really well in a case like that where we're just trying to bring some teeth out a little more to the facial to fill out that smile. You know, when you think of those smiles, you know, Whitney Houston, Julia Roberts, where they smile and you can just see wall-to-wall -wall teeth, it's because that buccal corridor is nice and full, and that's what we're going to achieve here with those no-prep veneers. I'm using those no-prep veneers on more and more veneer cases where we do veneers in the anterior just to really round it out and do the whole smile without having to do any extra preparation. At this point, the cement has been cured on all the teeth, and we're going in with my favorite occlusal adjustment burr, a 7408 burr. Sometimes these burrs feel a little aggressive when you're using them for the first time, and so I kind of like uh, once they've got to their second or third use, they're good for another 30 or 40 um, because they have been dulled just slightly, and they do a good job of removing ceramic material without causing as much abrasion as a diamond, which means easier polishing. And here's a close-up look at the patient's smile now with these restorations in place. And you can see how good that looks. The patient was very happy. Compare that with this before picture here. And you can see the shade change that we've had, the buccal corridor issues that have been solved, the fact that tooth number 10 was brought out of crossbite and that the midline was shifted a millimeter back uh, to the right again. So this was a nice combination of no prep veneers, minimal prep veneers, and a crown all made out of that same thin press material so that the material would match uh, pretty darn well all the way through the case, even though all these restorations were of different thicknesses. And we were able to do this because I sent the study model to the technician and got their input on how they want me to prepare that case for them. On behalf of all of us here at Glidewell Laboratories, I'd like to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry.